Hello. So, thank you, Blake. I'm Veronica Lopez. I come all the way from Mexico City. So, my talk will be a little bit different according to my experiences. I hope that you feel somehow related to it. The title is Beyond the Distributed Systems because everybody seems to be like super hyped about Go and using it for distributed, scalable, uh, concurrent systems, you know, but not everybody has like the luck or the fortune to live, to, to have a job like that. Some of us have like, have or had like more down to earth jobs. And that doesn't mean that we cannot use Go or take advantage of the whole future set that the core team has for us. Developers around the world, uh, it doesn't matter like what kind of country, but mostly outside of tech bubbles, choose uh, either a um, programming language or a tool to develop um, based on different reasons. Uh, the first one is that if it's cool, <laughs> if all the cool kids from all the cool projects are using it, if they saw it in Hacker News, Another uh, reason or option is like it is actually a good tool for the problems they're trying to solve and that other tools uh, haven't been able to solve them. Um, then another um, reason that is very recurrent in developing countries is because your boss requires you to, to know it because you, you have to work for clients or for people abroad that are requiring you to use that language. Uh, and well, the final and most important, it makes money, which doesn't have to be necessarily bad. I mean, uh, money somehow is very, very, very connected to uh, social progress. So there's nothing wrong about uh, people outside of tech bubbles using a programming language to get ahead of a bad situation. So, on the other hand, like leaving aside all the uh, social and, and economic problems of the world, we have a lot of types of developers around the world. But I like to, to make this division in my head. Like, on top of the pyramid, we have like contributors and people who run meetups and that write blog posts and that are like very prominent in communities. And of course, there, without them, uh, uh, a tool or a language is not well known at all, so nobody can use it. Uh, and then uh, it, it comes the cool people that work in cool projects, but it's still not the majority like of the developers out there in the world. Uh, of course, they inspire us, but they're not the majority. And then at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the real life programmers who use the language and the tools for real life problems, that doesn't necessarily mean like the most complex system or the next big thing. Outside of tech bubbles, like Silicon Valley, people use languages to make their lives easier to solve problems and not so much to create the next big scalable disruptive project. Yeah? Um, so not everybody dreams about creating distributed systems. Like. <laughs> Like, what do you mean? Well, of course we can dream about it, but uh, that doesn't mean that it has to be our only job. Like it or not, like over the years, sort of measurement that we have to know if a programming language or a tool is successful is not, of course, is of course not like uh, focusing on the big shiny project. Uh, what I mean with this is that think of Java, think of C, think of C++. Of course, they were used in the beginning for super awesome projects. And, but little by little, like, it started being spread along. Like, I don't know how many of you actually went to school to start computer science and you were taught with Java or C++, even if they were not the next big thing at that time. But those tools were a next big thing at some point. And I truly believe that Go is uh, going through that path. Um, so, well, these people, the people with real jobs solving, solving real problems or pro problems that might not seem very important for all the people, and I'm going to talk about this uh, in my next slides, uh, are actually what defines the success of a project. Uh, so think of schools uh, or the default languages, like how many of you or your colleagues 
uh, have like a go-to uh, language in mind for every single project, even if it's not the best tool like out there. Like for example, just to uh, if you work for clients or if you work on very tight schedules, deadlines, and budgets, uh, you usually have like a programming language that you select in order to do the work fast. So it doesn't mean that it's like uh, the best option. And I don't want to call names. <laughs> but uh, are, are, are we going to be ever ready to use Go as a default language? I think we can. Uh, and well, uh, user groups around the world uh, means that we have actual users, not just uh, content creators, but content consumers, which is OK. Then finally, uh, in this part, <laughs> um, code as a means of social progress um, means a lot for a lot of people in, in countries who really need it. Um, as, is, as distributed teams continue to grow, uh, people in these countries, or not, not just necessarily like in places who need it economically, but places that are not uh, so close to the tech centers or tech bubbles, um, I don't know, maybe many of you work for a US company or a remote company that is starting to use Go and you have need to, to, to learn it. So developers are starting to learn Go because it means an opportunity to get a better job, not just to create uh, the next big project. You know, it's just to have a better job and better lives. So, what if I'm actually part of a tech bubble? Does that mean that I can like, know what's going on outside? Well, actually, you do, and it's actually better. Uh, I remember that the first um, Go books and blog posts that appear, like, not the code, of course, but the resources for, for people, uh, were not that good, actually. Uh, I remember um, many of these resources uh, claiming that Go was the first tool to do whatever stuff, like, like as if there weren't other programming languages or tools already out there who could do the same, but like didn't explode it, like the the possibility of Go doing it, but better or different. This literature just ex explored uh, explored the the fact that Go was the only one, which wasn't true. So it's always healthy to look outside what you're doing, to know if someone else is not doing what you're already doing, or if there are better ways, or if you're not lying. So uh, I just want to mention a couple of use cases that go beyond the distributed system uh, cliche that you have to use Go for these uh, huge systems which is actually very cool, and I really respect people who do it, by the way. I'm not trashing anyone. <laughs> so, the first one is, uh, as of December 2014, uh, we Go developers can build Android apps. Um, now iOS too, but my focus for this talk is in an Android project, it's very cool. So, people, uh, was super excited that we could finally build uh, Android apps with Go, but uh, the building system was a little bit tricky, a, a little bit challenging. So a lot of people, of course, complained that the building system was not optimized or that um, the curve was pretty steep just to set up your product in order to do a hello world. <laughs> so everybody was like, so why should I bother? Um, and also the lack of um, explicit documentation. We had a lot of resources, but it was just like uh, recursive or very cryptic because only like people who wrote it uh, was able to do it, to understand it. So, including me. So, of course, I whined about it. Um, and well, whining almost made us miss the, the, the awesome point of, about all of this. Uh, that is that you can actually create mobile apps now with Go. Uh, avoiding Java, <laughs> and that's super awesome. The truth is that, well, they even have to put this disclaimer like in the official mobile repo because uh, it's still experimental. It has um, 
it has improved uh, since December last year uh, until now. Um, it has certainly improved. And a lot of people, I don't know if you, any of you have ever played with the Go Mobile um, feature of Go, but if you really uh, try hard, you can get awesome results. This hasn't stopped people from creating awesome Android apps beyond demos, of course. There's this project that I run the Mexico City meetup in my country. I co-run it. So the co-host one day was uh, talking to me about this awesome project called Lantern um, that is basically a desktop app that delivers fast and reliable uh, internet access for people uh, who live in censored, uh, well, who have censored internet in their countries or their offices. <laughs> <laughs> so Lantern works as a proxy uh, tool that lets you access blocked sites. Uh, it is, well, useful for any case that you want it, but of course this was uh, originally created for countries that um, live difficult situation communication-wise. And another parallel project called FireTweet uh, just ported the Lantern project into an Android app for Twitter, because as as many of you can know, like, uh, a lot of countries uh, restrict the usage of Twitter. So through this Android app created um, with the Go Mobile package, uh, you, you can have access to Twitter in all over the world, even if you live in countries that don't allow it. Um, and well, there are basically two ways. Uh, there are many talks about it, so I'm not going to go deep into the details, but uh, there are basically two ways to create an Android app with Go. Like, the first one is uh, natively. Like, you, and you can do the whole app with Go, like even uh, the UI, and with certain limitations, of course. And the second uh, way is to use it as a um, shell, a, a Java shell, and with shell I don't mean the shell technically, I, I mean an actual shell. Um, and then inside just call Go as libraries. So this is what uh, FireTweet did. Uh, they used the, the original creators, this is open source of course, um, they used the, the Lantern project and they ported it to to FireTweet as a Go library. So this is awesome because it, it was basically the same code for uh, the web client, and then you just cross-compile it to other platforms, and then this is an amazing use of Go. Um, well, uh, FireTweet, it works like uh, HTTP traffic is routed through a distributed network of uh, direct proxies. These are like sort of the details that I have already mentioned, but the most important thing of this is that there is still room for improvement. Of course, this is a very powerful app. Uh, the desktop client works pretty neat, but the mobile client still needs some improvement because what we basically did was um, we, we had the original Lantern project and we just tone it a little bit down because we didn't need the whole code for the project for the mobile Twitter app because we, we were just targeting Twitter. So in order to make it lighter, we tone it down a little bit, but uh, it still has room for improvement, which is cool because since it's open source, you can contribute. And it's also for a very good cause. So <laughs> Other cases, uh, well, I, I talked about the Android case that is beyond, well beyond the distributed system. And other cases, of course, uh, include education. That I know this is very ambiguous, but it's actually very important. As I mentioned like in, at some point in the talk, uh, just think of the programming languages that um, they taught us at school or that uh, people with not a lot of training uh, use for their day-to-day -day lives. So. Uh, I think Go is going through that path, and we have everything to achieve it. And well, as a conclusion, the programming languages uh, don't get successful because only because we do cool projects with them. But it's when real adoption starts happening, 
when the success comes. So Go is, of course, the next, the next big thing in a good sense. And well, also, if you organize a meetup, if you organize uh, a training, don't, don't reach for the stars. It's OK not to reach for the stars. Um, what has been super, super successful in my local meetup is uh, to avoid exactly reaching for the stars and just like, focusing on things that people actually use and things that people uh, can feel related to. It's like, OK, I just don't care if you can do this and this and this and that. But I really just want to know if I can do my job in an easier way with, without Java or without C Sharp or without .NET. So we focus on that. And we have been very successful. And we help people. And people keep coming. So it's like giving back to a community. And that creates a bigger uh, community worldwide because, uh, for example, our, our talks get published uh, for the worldwide community stuff like that. So it's very nice to contribute that away. So I hope uh, you think about uh, Go like from other perspectives uh, that could be very useful, um, not just for you or your company, but uh, for the world we're living in, even if that sounds very corny. <laughs> and well, thank you. <laughs>